Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I hope you all enjoyed that beautiful song just now. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and meet you from tonight, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the wider community and that who may be with us tonight. I acknowledge that the land on which I meet you from is stolen land and that Indigenous sovereignty has never been ceded and treaties are yet to be negotiated. Hello everyone, my name is Denise Adinas and I'm the president of New Gas Victoria and together with our vice president Eleni Zifas will be chairing tonight's seminar, which is part two of our crash course on the Greek War of Independence between history and myth history. If you missed part one, it is available for viewing on both the New Guests and Greek Community of Melbourne Facebook pages. So feel free to go check that out after tonight's seminar. For those of you who don't know what New Guests is, we're the National Union of Greek Australian Students. So we're a student-led not-for-profit organisation and we've had a place within the Greek community of Victoria and Australia for the past 50 years. So first and foremost, I would like to thank our speaker for tonight. So that's Yanni Cartledge. He's, um, for his tireless efforts and his amazing research that he's undertaken to present us all with this informative, uh, informative seminar. I would also like to thank the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne and Victoria and all involved in this seminar series, especially Nick Dallas for making this event possible. We're really grateful to be involved in this seminar on a topic which we believe many of today's youth or even older people might not hold a wealth of, wealth of knowledge about but which is really important and foundational to our knowledge of our history and identity. We're really pleased to be able to be involved in this seminar. Um, at this stage, I would just like to bring your attention to the fact that the formal seminar series will begin next Thursday at 7 p.m. So next week, Professor Vrasidas Karalis from the University of Sydney will present an online lecture entitled, Did the Greek Revolution of 1821 Really Happen? myths, counter myths and historical knowledge. So this will be a hybrid delivery. It will be streamed both online and it will also be streamed in person at the Greek Centre for those that wish to attend in person. By way of housekeeping tonight, could I please ask that everyone remains muted while the speakers are talking and that you refrain from sending through your questions until we're nearing the end of our seminar. Um, please do send them through the chat. We've set aside ample time at the end of this seminar for all questions to be answered at the end. Um, and that's all from me. I will now pass you over to Eleni Tsifas, the, the Vice President of Nugas. Good evening, everyone. As Denise previously mentioned, my name is Eleni Tsifas and I am VP of Nugas. This two-part series looks at the Greek War of Independence from a range of critical perspectives. Part one, which was last week's lecture, examined the relevant background knowledge of the revolution, establishing Greece and the Greek peoples placed in the Ottoman Empire, Europe, and the world during the 18th and early 19th centuries. These include important periods such as the modern Greek Enlightenment, as well as the rise of revolutionary ideas and nationalism in the Balkans. The question of who is a Greek was also unraveled, helping contextualize the beginnings of the uprising. Part one then explored the beginnings of the revolution and the initial outbreak. Part two, which is tonight's lecture, deals with the war of independence itself, including but not limited to the massacres, the civil war, the Egyptian invasion and Navarino. It will then cap the study off with the aftermath of the war and its modern legacy. Although much is covered, this series hopes to provide a diverse range of perspectives, ideas and meanings, and to help build a constructive discussion of the war on its 200th anniversary. Our speaker tonight is Yanni Cartledge, candidate for PhD at Flinders University, South Australia. Having a passion for Greek, Ottoman, British and Australian histories, as well as migration and diaspora histories, his current project aims to combine all these areas. The thesis titled Aegean Islander Migration to the United Kingdom and Australia, 1815 to 1945, Emigration, Settlement, Community Building and, and, and Integration, sorry, will investigate the cases of the Heos of London and Incarians of South Australia. His 2018 honours thesis explored the 1822 Heos massacre under the Ottoman Empire and the ways in which it affected British attitudes towards the Greeks, leading to Christian humanitarian intervention. An article deriving from his thesis titled The Heos Massacre 1822 and Early British Christian Humanitarianism 
was published in February 2020 in Historical Research. He's recently published a biographical entry of South Australian fisherman and seafood merchant George Agelakis in the Australian Dictionary of Biography. Now, without further ado, here is Yanni Cartledge. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, let me just get our screen up. So firstly, I would like to acknowledge that I'm giving this presentation from the lands of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual re uh, relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. I also acknowledge the traditional uh, custodians of the various lands on which you all live today and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people partaking in this seminar. Um, I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to their lands and waters. Um, secondly, um, again, I would like to also thank Nugus Victoria, especially Denise and Eleni, and the Greek community of Melbourne, especially Nick, Gostas and Bill, uh, for this opportunity to share this seminar with you all. Um, so last week we discussed the opening events of the Greek War of Independence and explored the key elements that fell into place for the war to begin, um, as well as the nature of Greek identity and the rise of Greek nationalism. Uh, we also introduced some of the key players and factions of the war who will shape the revolution's trajectory. Uh, today we will run over the key events of the war, um, as well as explore its aftermath and legacy. So this seminar is not to be taken as a complete history, um, but rather a brief overview that aims to present uh, a critical and diverse range of perspectives on the revolution. So we hope that it spurs on some further research and discussions surrounding the war. Um, so the Peloponnese, where the revolution began, became the center of the Greek War of Independence and the first liberated lands of the new nation of Greece. Um, it also became a heated region with multiple battlefronts throughout the war. Um, outside of the general narrative of independence battles, however, uh, the Greek revolution was plagued with a series of massacres. Um, these massacres arguably left a more traumatic lasting effect on the civilian populations of Greece and Ottoman Turkey than the war itself. Um, one of the most prominent early massacres was conducted by Greek revolutionary forces at Tripolitsa, uh, which is modern day Tripoli in the Peloponnese in, uh, on September, um, 1821. So Tripolitsa was the capital of the Ottoman province of Morea and occupying it was a strategic move for the revolutionaries. Tripolitsa began with the revolutionaries under Kolopotronis sieging the town in much the same way Kalamata was sieged. After months of sieging, the revolutionaries finally broke the Ottoman barricades and on 23rd of September, they flooded the town. Um, in the three days following, the revolutionaries took a different turn in their actions and proceeded to massacre the Muslim men, women and children of the town, as well as suspected Jewish and Christian supporters. Um, an estimated 15,000 Muslim and Jewish civilians were killed and the act shocked many and disturbed the Ottoman elites. Sadly, this was not the only massacre conducted by the revolutionaries and many of the revolutionary forces citing rev uh, vengeance as an excuse, justified this behavior, which had become the norm in their quest for independence. Um, the massacres were not only conducted by the revolutionaries either, and the Ottoman forces would also show similar behavior. Um, so before I discuss the Hios massacre, um, I would like to mention first the preceding massacre at Constantinople. So in 1821, following the outbreak of the Greek revolution, pogroms or religiously motivated attacks uh, began in Istanbul against Christians living in the city. Uh, St. Clair noted that the Ottoman government uh, decided to answer terror with terror and proceeded to co uh, consider a policy of exterminating all Greeks in the Ottoman Empire. However, this policy was quickly softened and replaced with a more selective policy by the Sultan. Um, on Easter Sunday, 1821, the Patriarch of Constantinople Gregorios V was accused of supporting the revolution and was hung in the streets of Istanbul. Uh, this was followed by the beheading of the Grand Dragoman, 
Konstantinos Morusis and other prominent Christians. Um, this set a precedent that was replicated by Ottoman authorities later in the war. So following Tripolitsa and Constantinople, the Hios massacre would become a pivotal moment in the Greek War of Independence. Um, it was the war's largest scale massacre and it caused shock throughout the world and Europe. Uh, the massacre on Hios was actually carried out in two stages, firstly by the Greek revolutionaries and secondly by the Ottoman fleet. I will attempt to briefly outline these stages and show its significance, as well as illustrate the extent of turmoil the war caused. Uh, so by the end of 1821, revolutionaries from the Peloponnese and Idra uh, began planning to liberate the Aegean islands. Chios, uh, one of the wealthiest and most influential islands in the region, was seen as a prime target for the revolution. So the plan to launch revolutionaries onto Chios was instigated by four men, uh, the Fenario uh, Dimitrios Ypsilantis, the revolutionary Lycurgos Logothetis of Samos, and two local but wealthy Chios, Alexander Rali and Antonios Punyas. Uh, it, it is also likely that there was input from the Filiki Eteria in their planning uh, via Ypsilantis's brother, Alexander. Uh, so in March 1822, one year after the outbreak of the revolution, Logothetis and Burmias led a revolutionary force from Samos to Chios. Uh, the group landed at Kafas, south of Chios's capital, where they defeated the small Ottoman resistance, set fire to the customs house, and destroyed and defaced mosques and Muslim coffee houses. However, once done with the Muslim establishments in the main town, the revolutionaries attacked both Orthodox and Catholic Hiots. Uh, they targeted and stole from wealthy locals, raped local islanders, burned Venetian warehouses, and robbed from Orthodox churches, mimicking uh, much of the same behavior that was seen in Tripolitsa and elsewhere. So liberation for some of these revolutionaries was not always about bringing freedom to their fellow Greeks, but rather seen as an opportunity to literally pillage and plunder. Um, after the Greeks had claimed Chios for the revolution, uh, the Ottomans sought to reclaim the prosperous island. Uh, this second stage of the massacre on Chios, however, was carried out in a more orchestrated and devastating fashion. Um, so on Good Friday, uh, the 11th of April, 1822, in an attempt to reclaim Chios, the Ottomans offered the Samian insurgents eight hours to surrender and accept a pardon. Uh, despite the offer, the revolutionaries rejected the Sultan's pardon. And on the 12th of April, um, Kara Ali Pasha, the head of the Ottoman fleet, landed 7,000 men on the island with the orders to kill and waylace the land. Um, to avoid combat with the powerful Ottoman forces, the revolutionaries fled to the nearby island of Psara, leaving the islanders vulnerable. So following these events, um, the Ottoman forces proceeded to kill and waylace to the island. Um, approximately 100,000 Hiots were enslaved, massacred or displaced due to the actions of the Ottoman fleet. And customs registers list around 41,000 of those being enslaved and exported to Anatolia. Um, many scholars cite the motivating factors behind the Hios massacre as a revenge massacre for Tripolitsa and the other massacres against Muslims on the mainland. However, the massacre also may have been a strategic move in crippling the Hiots, who could have posed a major threat to the Ottomans if they decided to join the revolution. So in vengeance, the revolutionary fleets of Idra and Psara, led by admirals Andreas Miaulis and Konstantinos Canaris, uh, led a series of counterattacks on the Ottoman fleet while it was docked in the, uh, in the harbor during Ramadan. Thousands of Ottoman troops were killed and Kara Ali Pasha was fatally wounded and he died later in the fort of Hios. So the massacre saw a turning point in Ottoman policy in dealing with the revolution. And in the following years, the entire populations of the islands of Psara and Kassos uh, were annihilated in a similar fashion. Uh, so it is by this point, I should, it should be mentioned that a new group of players had established themselves uh, as part of the revolution. Um, European and American Philhellenes, meaning friends of the Greeks, uh, had been large supporters of the creation of a Greek nation in the years leading up to the war. 
Uh, few Hellenes were often academics or wealthy elites who had both uh, a love for classical history and in previous years completed the Grand Tour, a rite of passage trip for young nobles to the homelands of classical history, including Italy, Greece, and the Middle East. So many of these Philhellenes uh, saw the war as an opportunity to recreate classical Greece, and they often were some of the largest donors and investors in the revolution. So the most notable way they achieved this was through the establishment of Philhellenic committees, um, including the most famous Greek committee of London. These committees were responsible for gathering large donations, and uh, usually this was done by circulating pamph pamphlets and offering subscriptions. So with the funds they collected, the Philhellenes supplied the revolutionaries with medicines, printing presses, paper for printing, and most likely weapons. Uh, they also funded education programs, uh, such as the Lancastrian schools, Philhellenic organizations, such as the Philomuse Society, and newspapers, uh, such as the Greek Telegraph, Greek Chronicle, and the Athens Free Press. Um, so one Philhellene, uh, Frederick, uh, Lord Frederick North, the Earl of Guildford, self-funded the founding of the Ionian Academy alone. So many of the Philhellenes even partook in the war, leading to uh, leading and fighting alongside Greek forces. <clears throat> so the most famous of these uh, was the poet Lord Byron, and he is venerated in Greece today. Uh, George Gordon Byron was born in London uh, into a wealthy naval family. Byron uh, first traveled to the Mediterranean in 1809 after his studies uh, to complete his own grand tour. Byron's travels lasted three years and he returned to England in 1811, infatuated with Ottoman and Mediterranean culture. By the time of the Greek revolution's outbreak, Byron had been permanently dwelling in Genoa. Uh, in 1823, Byron, wanting to be a part of the revolution, arrived on the island of Gefalonia, uh, which was a British possession at the time. While there, he spent 4,000 pounds of his own fortune on refitting the Greek fleet. And in December, 1823, he traveled to Missolonghi on mainland Greece, where he joined forces with Greek revolutionary Alexandros Mavrokodatos. Uh, in Missolonghi, Byron had unfortunate troubles trying to navigate the various Greek factions who all wanted his financial support. Uh, so Byron even sold his family manor in England to fund the cause. Uh, in February 1824, Byron and Mavrokodatos had made plans to lead an attack on the Ottomans at Nafpaktos. However, Byron fell ill of an unspecified illness and in April 1824, he died, likely due to the bloodletting practices that were used to treat him. Um, so an interesting read for more on Byron is an article by A.R. Mills, who discusses the possible diagnosis of Byron's illness. Um, so the factions that had stifled Byron's career in Greece were one of the largest hindrances to the progress of the revolution. So much so that in 1823, a civil war broke out between the two major uh, sides of the revolution. So the civil war was sparked between the largely cleft controlled forces of the Peloponnese under Kolokotronis against the Fe uh, Fenariot led forces of central Greece and the islands, especially from Idra. The Fenariot leaders uh, with Mav Mavrokodatos at their helm held vastly different views and came from very different backgrounds to the clefs. Um, in fact, the two factions had been at loggerheads, uh, loggerheads since 1821. So during November 1822, a national assembly was proposed where the new Greek nation could decide its constitution, elections and Senate. Kolokotronis, however, was not in agreement with the proposed election methods and declared that the Peloponnese region would organize their own assembly at Nafplio. Uh, this aggravated tensions between the two sides of the revolution. The National Assembly finally happened in March 1823 in Astros, where a new constitution was drawn, um, and in an attempt to include Kolokotronis, they invited him to take the position of vice president, which he accepted. Mavrokodatos, however, was voted in as president and much of the legislative body was of the islander controlled faction, which caused a rift between Vice President Kolokotronis and the revolutionary government. So by March 1824, the rift had developed into a civil war and the revolutionary government laid siege to both Nafplio, 
where Golokotronis' son Panos was in charge, and Tripolitsa, uh, which was another cleft stronghold. By April, an agreement was reached to end the civil war, and Kolokotronis began to regroup his forces and regain his strength in the region. Uh, this was not the last of the animosity between the two revolutionary factions, and a second civil war shortly broke out in 1824. Um, however, it was curbed by 1825 when the Egyptian forces under Ibrahim Pasha arrived in the Peloponnese. So this series of civil wars truly highlighted the divisiveness in the Greek revolution. Um, they displayed both a class separation in the revolutionaries between the self-made clefts and the wealthy fenarios, as well as fundamental ideological differences between the two factions, uh, which no doubt stem from their different origins, both economically and geographically. So uh, Egypt during the period um, existed in an unusual space of government. Since 1805, the Muhammad Ali dynasty, headed by Muhammad Ali Pasha, um, had taken control of the region. And however, they still acknowledged the Ottoman Sultan as head of state. However, Egypt was really vastly autonomous and had a separate and arguably more prosperous economy to the rest of the Ottoman Empire. Muhammad Ali Pasha himself was originally an Albanian aristocrat and military commander uh, born in Kavala in Ottoman Macedonia. Muhammad Ali was originally sent to Egypt with his forces to recover it from French occupation under Napoleon. After Napoleon's withdrawal, um, Muhammad Ali saw a power vacuum, which he quickly capitalized on and earned himself the rank of Pasha and position as governor. So during the 1820s, the Egyptians were on a path of expansion. Uh, they had previously expanded into the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Peninsula, fighting the Saudis between 1811 and 1818. And with support of the Ottomans between 1824, uh, 1820 and 1824, the Egyptians also conquered Sudan, parts of Ethiopia and Eastern Libya. And the, this expansion saw Egypt become a serious power in the Eastern Mediterranean during the 19th century. Uh, many scholars acknowledge, however, that Muhammad Ali may have had some paranoia as to his, his stance with the Ottoman Sultan Mahmud II. So dreading the possibility of the lack of future Ottoman support and defence, he decided to help the Sultan uh, suppress the Greek revolution. So the revolution was really the perfect war to solid, uh, solidify his relations with the Sultan. So in 1825, Muhammad Ali sent his son, Ibrahim Pasha, as well as the largest fleet seen in the Mediterranean since Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798. Um, Ali had bargained that in helping the Sultan, Crete, Cyprus, the Peloponnese and Syria would become part of the Egyptian realm. Um, the Egyptians were very successful in their intervention, especially in the islands. And in the Peloponnese, Ibrahim Pasha led a successful campaign besieging and capturing many key cities, including the port of Navarino. Uh, the Egyptian intervention in the war, however, brought up further questions of foreign intervention, especially from the Russians, who had previously promised protection for Ottoman Christians. Up until this point, the European powers, such as Britain, France and Russia, had held a legitimate stance towards the revolution. So they were viewing it as an internal Ottoman problem which did not need wider European intervention. Um, the only intervention had come on the part of the previously discussed Philhellenes, who often criticized their government's lack of attention to the issue. Um, thus, the Egyptian invasion uh, contributed to changing the, uh, the opinions and motivations of the European powers. This started a discourse known as the Eastern Question, uh, which was the question of what to do with the Ottoman Empire's slow decline. The, uh, the Greek Revolution became the first new nation on the agenda of the Eastern Question and was an opportunity for the European powers to gain a strategic ally in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so the European intervention came at a key moment in the revolution. In 1827, after a shift in policy towards the war, uh, Russia, France and the United Kingdom signed the Treaty of London which both ordered the end of the war and forced the Ottomans to grant the Greeks an autonomous status. Uh, this, however, was not embraced by the Ottomans, who had thrown so much uh, resources and manpower behind their efforts to quell the revolt. 
So in order to enforce the armistice, the three European powers all sent a fleet to the Mediterranean to try and secure peace in the region. The Allied fleet under British Admiral Sir Edward Condrington, uh, French Henri de Rigny and the Dutch Lodovic uh, van Heyden, who represented Imperial Russia, began a blockade of the Egyptian and Turkish fleets, uh, led by Ottoman, Tahir, uh, Ottoman Amir Tahir Pasha and Ibrahim Pasha, who were docked in the Bay of Navarino, uh, which was modern day Pilos in the southeast of the Peloponnese. Um, so really, there are two versions of events that happened at Navarino. So before any fighting commenced, uh, this is the European version, uh, the Allied forces sent a messenger boat hoping to broker a deal with the Ottomans. The Ottoman fleet, however, mistakenly fired at the messenger ship, assuming it was hostile. In retaliation, the Allied fleet decimated the Ottoman and Egyptian ships, with three quarters of the fleet being destroy, uh, destroyed. This event began the slow de uh, de withdrawal of Ottoman forces from the Rumelia region. And within 10 months, the war had mostly ceased and the Ottomans had left the region that would become modern Greece. Uh, the narrative of how the sea, battles, uh, the sea battle started, however, has been questioned by many historians. Shaw and Shaw tell a very different story, uh, an, an almost opposite story, where the Allied fleet was attempting to lure Ottomans into a battle by blockading the harbour. In this alternative narrative, an Ottoman ship approached the Allies and the Allied fleet began to fire at it. The Allies then decimated the rest of the Ottoman and Egyptian fleet. Um, this reversal of narrative is a point of contention among many historians and adds to the ambigu uh, ambiguity of both the intentions of the Europeans and the truth in the history that we are taught. So many, many scholars uh, also consider Navarino a milestone event for maritime history, um, as it was the last major battle using only wooden sailing ships. So following this event, European naval fleets began concentrating on upgrading uh, to the superior steamships. Uh, so it is arguable whether the free European powers had more invested in the war of independence than just a, a sense of compassion for the Greeks. So following Navarino in 1830, the French Navy truly capitalized on the declining Ottoman Empire. And they invaded Algeria, which was partly under Ottoman control and partly independent. The French invasion was successful and Algeria became part of the French empire and Algeria only received its independence from France in 1962. Russia similarly uh, capitalized and in 1828, only a year after Navarino, the Russo-Turkish war was declared. So this was originally an access dispute after Sultan Mahmoud II closed the Dardanelles uh, to Russian ships due to Russia's invo involvement in Navarino. The Russo-Turkish War expanded to two major fronts, um, the Balkans and the Caucasus. It culminated in the Treaty of Adrianople um, in 1829, where Russia gained territory in the, Danub uh, sorry, in the Danubian principalities, the Black Sea and Armenia, as well as autonomy for Serbia and a temporary Russian occupation of Moldavia and Wallachia. So Russia also fo uh, forced Mahmoud II to officially recognize Greek independence in that treaty. So following this, a slow chipping away at the Ottoman Empire began. This included the British taking control of Egypt, which lasted from 1882 to 1956, and a mass of new nationalist movements in the Balkans and Middle East, and the eventual division of the empire after World War I. So the year modern Greece officially became a nation is disputed. Um, some recognize the revolutionary governments of 1821 or 1822. Some recognize the Sultan's recognition in 1829. Um, some see the proclamation of the Kingdom of Greece in 1832 as its beginnings. Um, in 1827, however, the first Hellenic Republic was officially declared after the third National Assembly at Trozen and Ioannis Kapodistrias uh, was declared uh, governor and Nafplio was chosen as its capital. Uh, many scholars do refer to Kapodistrias as president of the newly formed nation. So Kapodistrias uh, was born in Corfu during uh, Venetian rule to a noble family. Um, his father's family had origins from northern Italy and Slovenia, 
and an ancestor of theirs had been given the title of Count of the Venetian city of Cappadistria, which is modern day Copa in Slovenia. His mother's family, the Gonomis, were also of the nobility, um, originating in Cyprus, but emigrating to Crete, then Iberos, then Corfu. So, like many nobles of the era, Kapodistrios studied at the University of Padua, Italy, and became a medical doctor. Following this, his career was quite diverse, and he served as a minister in both the Septentrional Republic and the uh, Russian diplomatic service. In 1822, um, uh, sorry, Kapodistrios was actually not in Greece during the revolution, but was rather living in wider Europe working as a diplomat and had actually expressed neutral views on the war at first. However, in 1822, after the hanging of Patriarch Gregorios V, Kapodistrias moved to Geneva uh, in Switzerland and began writing and organizing pro-revolutionary materials. Kapodistrias did not arrive in the newly formed Greece until 1828, after he was elected as governor. So Kapodistrias' time as head of state uh, however, was actually plagued by the similar factions and infighting that had caused the civil wars uh, years earlier. So the rich ship owners of Idra planned an unsuccessful coup in 1829, and the independent maniots of the southern Peloponnese refused to pay taxes to a centralized government. To deal with this, Kapodistrias ordered the imprisonment of the maniot leader Petrobe Mavromichalis in 1831. Uh, the Mavro Michalis family then held a vendetta with Kapodistrias. So not long after the arrest, Kapodistrias was assassinated by Mavro Michalis' brother and son on the steps of the St. Spiridon Church in Nafplio. His brother, Augustinos Kapodistrias, succeeded him as governor for six months until the establishment of the Kingdom of Greece. So in 1830, the three European powers, Britain, France, and Russia came together again and updated their former stance of wanting an autonomous Greece to Greece becoming a completely independent sovereign state. Uh, this known as the London Protocol would be updated again in 1832 at the London Conference where borders were established and Greece was declared a kingdom. So the London Conference would ultimately spur on the Treaty of Constantinople which was signed between Britain, France, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. This laid out the decisions made um, to the Ottomans, including the establishment of Greece's borders and the decision on a German noble to become a no monarch on the Greek throne. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was also compensated by the powers for the loss of territory, and the empire received 40 million kurush, which was a very substantial amount. So the division of the original Greek borders are outli as outlined in the treaty are as follows. And as you can see, green represents the 1832 borders. Uh, this included the Peloponnese, Central Greece, Evia, the Cyclades and the Sporades. The next additions to Greece did not occur until 1864, uh, which are the purple Ionian islands. So the administration of Greece from 1828 uh, was not just in the hands of the discussed Greek factions and the incoming monarch. Uh, there were three political parties set up as well after Navarino, each backed by a foreign power. So these were duly named the English party, the Russian party and the French party. These parties dominated Greece for its first 30 years until 1862. So their presence kept foreign influence and motivations at the center of Greek politics begging the question of whether early modern Greece was truly independent, or was it a foreign dominated buffer zone between the European powers and the Ottoman Empire? So the three parties also represented and had the support of the various Greek factions of the revolution. Uh, the English party was seen as being more liberal and supportive of a constitution and a monarch, and had the support of many aristocratic Greeks, especially from the islands, such as the Fenariots, uh, as well as friends, friends of the English Philolines. These included names such as Mavakotatos and the well-known Spiridon Trikupis, um, among others. The Russian party was naturally uh, pro-Orthodox and more conservative than the other parties and included many mainland Greeks and their cleft leaders, such as Kolopatronis and Kitsos Tsavelos. Uh, some islanders, 
such as the Admiral Konstantinos Canaris and the Filiki Eteria member Andreas Metaxas were also members. Um, most notably, however, the party included uh, Governor Ioannis and Augustinos Kapodistrias, both of whom had ties to Imperial Russia, uh, likely through their diplomatic service there. Um, the French party was similar to the English in many ways, uh, including its liberal views and constitutionalism. However, it spoke to a different demographic than the islander dominated English party. Um, it was also uh, relatively anti-monarchy, um, differentiating it again. Uh, he, ha he had the support of many landowners in central Greece and the Peloponnese, who likely had differing views from the cleft counterparts. Um, it was officially founded by Ioannis Koletis of Epiros in 1824, so it actually preceded this era. Um, so the Kingdom of Greece was founded in 1832 after the London Conference and Treaty of Constantinople. Uh, so as already said, a somewhat neutral German noble was cho chosen to assume the throne. So the first choice was actually Prince Leopold of Saxe, Coburg and Gotha. Uh, he had fought against Napoleon with the Imperial Russian Army and had married Princess Charlotte of Wales, daughter of King George IV. Uh, Leopold, however, did not want the throne of Greece and became king of Belgium instead in 1831. And his son was the infamous Leopold II, who was responsible for uh, the events of Belgian Congo. Um, so the offer then went to the young Ottoman, uh, the young Otto, sorry, <laughs> Prince of Bavaria. Otto was a somewhat more neutral candidate, and he pleased um, Britain, France, and Russia. He also claimed descent from the Byzantine royal dynasties of Komnenos and Laskaris, and this was em emphasized by the European powers to hopefully build a connection with the Greek people, many of whom were skeptical of having another foreign ruler, including Kolokotronis and the cleft factions in particular. So Kolokotronis was actually sentenced to death for treason and conspiracy under Otto in 1834. However, he received a pardon the following year. In 1834, Otto also made the decision to move the Greek capital from Nafplio to Athens. Um, this was probably spurred by his love of classical history. In 1836, Otto married Amalia of Oldenburg and the couple, however, had no children, which caused a succession crisis and distrust in the monarchy. Otto's reign was also plagued with infighting, especially between the three parties. And his failure to convert to orthodoxy also drew much criticism from the Greek public and from the Russians. In 1862, while visiting the Peloponnese, a governmental coup took place and Otto was eventually exiled and replaced by the Danish George I, whose family would remain on the Greek throne until the end of the Greek monarchy in 1973. Um, interestingly, Otto was fascinated with Greek culture and showed many few Hellenic tendencies that other young nobles like Byron showed during the war. He continued to wear traditional Greek dress in exile. And in 1866, Otto uh, donated most of his wealth to support a revolt on Crete uh, against the Ottomans. Supposedly, Otto may have even had a love child with a Sarakatsani woman, Maria Tangus, in 1835. And the son, Manoli Tangus, was actually moved to Athens and his descendants are still there today. Uh, so the rise of nationalism and the independence movements in Greece um, and elsewhere in the Ottoman Empire pushed Sultan Mahmud II to make a series of reforms known as the Tanzimat, uh, which means reordering in Turkish. So these reforms were seen as both radical and modernizing and which shaped the last 80 years of the Ottoman Empire. Um, I won't go through all these reforms. I've put some key ones here. Um, but I'd like to bring to your attention, firstly, some reforms that brought the Ottoman Empire up to speed with where many other countries were at. Um, so in 1844, the Ottoman Empire introduced a national anthem and a flag. Um, and in 1844, they also uh, conducted their first census and the introduction of identity cards. Um, some more radical and uh, progressive ideas that the Ottomans actually passed as well was the abolition of slavery and the Ottoman slave trade in 1847. 
and the decriminalization of homosexuality in 1858. So these reforms were very progressive and painted, painted a new era for the empire and its inhabitants. So the question that we discussed last week of who was a Greek spoke to a time before Greek nationality existed. Um, so the Greeks came uh, clearly came under different identities, uh, the, including Greki, Elines, and most prominently Romi. Uh, Greeks also navigated many different personal, regional, historical, administrative, and religious identities. However, as Greece was not a nation at that point, a national identity did not uniformly exist. After the 1820s and the establishment of the nation, however, uh, the, Western, uh, the question became, who was now a Greek? Um, so the lands of, modern Greek, of the modern Greek nation were still multicultural and multilingual, uh, with large Avanite, Vlach, Turkish, Jewish, Slavic-speaking and Catholic communities, among no doubt other ethnicities. The Greek identity now became tied to the existence of the nation state and the revolution which founded it. Um, many Avanite and Vlach communities, for, ex uh, for example, embraced an overarching Greek or Hellenic national identity. So these people, uh, these peoples who had never been united under one flag or one administration now shared a flag, anthem, a king and identity as well as look towards a centralized government and church centered on Athens and a shared official language. So the characteristics that would make someone Greek uh, were really as follows. They were an Orthodox Christian. Uh, they spoke or learned um, standardized Greek language. They lived within the borders of the kingdom of Greece. They shared the ideas of the revolution as their nation's origins. They considered themselves a Hellene and they adopted Hellenic history as their own. Um, so after this, the idea of Enosis, the union of Greek lands with Greece, uh, became the next forefront of nationalist agenda over the following century. Enosis even became a discussion among foreign powers. Um, so Enosis movements, particularly in Crete, Cyprus, Macedonia, and the Aegean islands, received much attention and geopolitical discourse. Uh, they all came under the banner of the wider Eastern question. So the Cretan problem, for instance, received much attention in Britain. Uh, this was especially noted through the Cretan revolts of 1866 and 1878. Um, in 1897, the Cretan problem erupted into the Greco-Turkish war um, and after pogroms against Christians on the island. Britain, France, Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Russia all intervened against the Ottomans in this war, uh, which resulted in Crete becoming an independent state under supervision of the European powers who had divided Crete into various zones, which they administered. Um, Crete eventually joined Greece in 1913 and the Muslim minority of Crete would eventually be exported to Turkey in 1923 in the infamous population ex exchange between the two nations. Cyprus, uh, sorry, Cypriot Enosis is also another topic of contention. So in 1950, a referendum was held um, in Cyprus that asked whether the island should join Greece. And while this was happened while the under was under British control, the answer was a 95% yes. However, only Greek Cypriots had voted and it was conducted under the supervision of Orthodox clerics. So despite not joining Greece, the referendum is celebrated in Greek Cypriot schools as a momentous event, and many Greek Cypriots today also celebrate the 25th of March. So before uh, finishing and discussing the legacy of the war, I would like to quickly address a, a question from last week. Um, so this question was the uh, someone posed was the role of women during the Greek rev revolution. And um, they wanted more info besides the usually quoted Bubulina and Mavroyenus, uh, which was discussed in question time last week. Um, I would like to say I think it's an important and underrepresented area of research on the revolution. Um, but as I'm not a, an expert on this and didn't have enough time to gather too much research together, um, I've provided some of the following links uh, as part of the suggested reading, um, which may give more information for those who wish to follow this further. Um, so these are all included in the suggested reading that was sent out. However, an in-depth study on women during the revolution is still needed as this appears to be a gap in the current literature on the war. 
Um, so to finish off, I'd like to talk about the legacy of the war. Um, so this is an endless field of discussion. For many Greeks, the legacy is symbolic and the war is seen as the symbol of their nationhood. It is essentially an origin story, similar to Australian Federation in 1901 or the American War of Independence from Britain. However, the war has also left physical legacies such as artwork, poetry, song, dance, folklore, and modes of celebrations, uh, many of which I'm sure we will all see this year. Uh, the physical legacy also extends to diasporas, uh, the Greek communities outside of Greece, um, including some who originated during the War of Independence. Um, so one of the most prominent diasporas, the Hyotes, uh, fled the Hios massacre en masse in 1822 and settled in the ports of Europe, most prominently in London. Um, other diasporas, such as the adoption of Greek war orphans into the United States, was also a lasting legacy of the revolution. Um, one of the first free Greek immigrants to Australia was actually Katerina Yuria Plesos. Um, Katerina was actually a refugee from the revolution and migrated to Sydney in 1835 with her British husband, Major James Cromer. So the war also leaves us with a lasting intellectual legacy. Um, on the role of both empire and nationalism in, the 19th, nationalism in the 19th century world. Not only does it paint the picture of the decline of the Ottoman Empire, but it also shows the growing influence of Imperial Russia, Britain and France, and the growth of nationalist movements, particularly in the Balkan region. The context that this period created would eventually spill over into the 20th century, culminating in the First and Second World Wars. Um, this, in a sense, ultimately shaped our modern world and directly affects us today. So I believe the Greek War of Independence also leaves us with a healthy and ch challenging discussion of national memory and national myth and provides us with an endless topic of research for historians and history enthusiasts who are attempting to decipher the past. Um, so I hope this has been a helpful seminar series and please make sure to look out for all the upcoming seminars and events this year um, from the Greek community of Melbourne, as well as from Nugus and from other organisations that you may be um, part of. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much, Yanni, for your presentation. Um, we will begin our questions, questions and answers. And we do, so feel free at this stage um, to write your questions in the chat if you're on the Zoom or also on Facebook if you're tuning in live. So we have a question from Constantine Spiropoulos and he has said, thank you once again, Yanni, for your virtual public lecture. Playing devil's advocate here, why did the Ottoman Empire fail to suppress the Greek revolution? Thank you. Um, thanks, Constantine. Uh, so many factors um, outside of Navarino and big events like that, that um, did help uh, Greeks in their struggle. Um, one was that the Ottomans were divided for the opening years of the war. I discussed their war with the Persians um, last week, and this kind of split the Ottoman um, forces two ways. Um, other, there were some other major things, though, as well as there was an increased decentralization in the Ottoman Empire. So many regions, such as Egypt, Epirus, um, and others, had their own systems in place with their own governors that were very, very powerful and um, not always willing to help um, the Sultan in his struggles. Um, so I think this was a major region, a uh, major reason. Um, there's probably a lot more reasons and I could probably go on about this for ages because I find it really fascinating. But yeah, they, um, I think there was uh, probably a couple centuries lead up to the moment that led to why the Ottomans couldn't suppress the Greeks. Um, yeah, and I think the Sultan at the time wasn't responsible for losing Greece, but he sort of inherited a land which he couldn't hold on to in, in essence. Um, so yeah, th thanks for your question, Constantine. Thank you for that answer, Yanni. Uh, Petros Rosakeas has asked, why do you think the Magnets refuse to pay tax? Um, I'm not too sure. I, look, they were a very, always a very independent people. Um, the Mani Peninsula actually never officially fell to the Ottomans. So they were technically always independent. Um, maybe they, in that sense of independence um, 
and they're obviously governing themselves, having their own local economy, um, was such a strong pull for them that they refused to send their money outside of their sort of relatively isolated independent region. Um, maybe there was also political differences in the in um, actually having a couple of these trias or later on Otto as rulers who were not people that were there during the revolution or part of the revolution profoundly. Um, so yeah, I think that there's probably a, a bunch of reasons, but I think their independence, um, their original independence would be the main, the main one there. Thank you again, Yanni. Um, we have a question from Helen, excuse me for the pronunciation, Gothels, Helen has said, Ex excellent overview, thank you. Was the war fought and won more at sea than on land? Was this part of the civil wars? Um, so I, I would say the war was won at sea with Navarino. Um, the Ottoman fleet was such a powerful force and they could launch invasions with ease, like, like they did on Hios um, during the massacre. So losing the Ottoman fleet really was the key moment where the Ottomans had lost. However, as we all know, Greece is a very mountainous and treacherous place. So once the revolutionaries did take land, uh, areas of land, it was very hard once you're entrenched to be removed as well. And for the Ottomans to spread their forces all over Greece um, would have spread them quite thin. So I think there was actually quite a balance between um, revolutionaries like Kolokotronis, who were so good at taking um, taking regions in the Peloponnese and elsewhere, as well as the loss of the Ottoman fleet. So, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And John Katsoulis has asked, what was the relative contribution of the three European powers in the Balkan events leading up to World War I elsewhere in Europe compared to in Greece? Did the Greek Revolution indirectly lead to World War I? Um. I'm going to start with your second question. I do believe the Greek Revolution did indirectly lead to World War One. I. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of evidence for it. Um, it wasn't the only factor, obviously, but it was a major factor, um, as well as uh, yeah. I think definitely it it was part of a chain of events that led to um, Serbian nationalism in the Balkans, which obviously sparked World War One. Um, so yeah, that there was other reasons as well that started World War One, as we've been taught the um, alliance systems and things like that. But I think one of the main, especially ideological reasons, probably stemmed from the same ideas behind the Greek Revolution. Um, the relative uh, contribution of the three European powers in the Balkan events leading up to where World War One. So I'm guessing we're talking about the Balkan Wars. Um, I actually haven't researched almost, I've not researched anything about it. I'm, I'm not sure if Nick or anyone else has looked deep at the Balkan Wars, but um, I think this would be an interesting comparison to make. So, um, yeah, Nick, I'm not sure if you've got much to say on that. Look, it's a, it's a very complex discussion. You're trying to make a link from, let's say, it's like a hundred year time span um, between events. Um, but I think there are also many other factors that sort of led to sort of, um, World War, uh, World War One as well. So yeah, um, yeah. Probably can't expand on it too much. It's 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 a bit more of a complex. This the answers are much more complex, I think. And um, yeah. I just want to add, Yanni, that um, um, you did talk about Enosis before the Megalia there, there was also um, after Greece became independent, one of the driving forces of uh, well governments at the time to sort of. Um, acquired Greek lands, which had a very significant Greek population as well. That was driving the expansion policy as well. So, yeah. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Yanni, for that answer. Do we have any more questions? Feel free to send them in the chat. Anything on the Facebook Live? Oh, yeah, on Facebook. Wonderful.
All right. Nick, do you have access to the Facebook Live questions? You're, you're on mute, Nick. Right. They're really now the questions on Facebook. They're just comments. and um, yeah. Just comments? Okay, just wonderful. Comments. So we're happy to wrap up here. Oh, there is a question coming through. Let me just read it out. Okay, this is from Theo Vosnivis. What was life like for Greeks in the occupied parts of the Ottoman Empire during and after the revolution? Did they get punished? Uh, for instance, from my own family's experience, they, they lived relatively the same after Greece became independent, but outside of Greece. Um, Nick might have more to add on this point, actually. Yeah, can, can I just add, although the major expulsions occurred and, and, and massacres occurred in the, um, the early part of the 20th century, even towards the second half of the 19th century, um, if you're you know, of Greek background in the Ottoman Empire, you were perceived as more distressful. There were some um, expulsions and people movements, uh, not as significant as the ones, let's say, in the um, early 20th century, but um, there had been articles published on expulsion from certain parts of Asia Minor towards the second half of the 19th century. I mean, I can't recall places and figures on the spot, but uh, I suppose the fact that you had now an in independent Greek nation state and you were a Greek speaking citizen outside that, especially in the Ottoman Empire, um, your loyalty might have come under um, question by some. Thanks, Dick. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that question, Thea, and for those answers. We've got another one from Facebook from Despina Likopandis. Why did the Europeans decide Greece needed a monarchy when they had so much poverty? Um, yeah, good question. Thanks, uh, Despina. Um, the main reason I believe they decided Greece needed a monarchy, um, I think there were two reasons. I think, one, having a Western or Northwestern European king on the throne uh, of Greece kind of kept sort of um, another European influence in the uh, Greek nation. Um, I also believe that, uh, especially due to the civil wars and a couple of these guys getting um, assassinated, there was probably a sense of not trusting the Greeks to govern themselves, um, which was probably discussed. I'm sure there was discussions around that as well. Um, but yeah, I think it was, a, it was a balance of the Europeans keeping their influence in Greece as well as not trusting the Greeks to govern themselves. Um, maybe as well, having a, having a, a Western, Northwestern European king, also they could kind of treat Greece like a, a neutral satellite state or a buffer zone between Western Europe and the Ottoman Empire as well. So yeah, um, Nick, you might have some more to add on that if you, as well. Uh, no, I don't have anything else to add, no. Yeah. Well, thank you, Vespina, for that question and for that answer, Yanni. Is there any more before we wrap up? Any more questions before you send them through? All right, we might wrap up there. Any more questions, feel free to email through to either Nugis's email or the Greek Community of Melbourne. We'll put that into the chat too. Um, once again, thank you, Yanni, for such an informative uh, presentation. We hope everyone listening has gained new insights into the War of Independence. We would like to reiterate our gratitude towards the Greek Orthodox community of Melbourne, particularly Nick Dallas and Costa Sablonitis, for their hard work and for helping Nugis and the youth foster cross-community co collaboration. We look forward to future collaborations and especially the formal seminar series that we mentioned before, which begins next week, that will be streaming live at the mezzanine at the Greek Centre, as well as online. So a massive thank you again to everyone involved. Thanks. Thanks, Yami. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone.